Today on Face the State, his life reads like an Alastair McLean high adventure novel, but this time it's for real. We'll talk with a man who knew Winston Churchill, fought with George Patton, and went behind the lines saving thousands of Jewish children from the Nazis. Part one and two of our interview with Max Chambouli and a hero of the Allies in the Second World War. It's incredible. He's got a book out about his exploits. It's on Face the State. Welcome to this segment of Face the State. We have two very special guests for you today. And um, so special that we're going to kind of violate our own protocol. And we're going to do two segments on our, our wonderful guests. You're going to see one this week. You'll see the, uh, uh, the second one uh, the following week. And they'll both be together at that point in time. Um, it is very rare that you have the opportunity to address a, a living link with history in a remarkable time when uh, the country and the world actually were threatened by, as it says in the book, the greatest evil the world has ever known. And the gentleman that we're going to talk to today uh, lived a remarkable life and did some incredibly heroic things during World War II, all behind the lines. Um, he wrote a book about it. It's Max and Linda Champoli. Is it, am I Champoli? Perfect. Okay, I'm, my French is a little bit off here, but Sorry. I'm. So thank you for being with us. The book is called Churchill's Secret Agent, and I just before we get any further, I want to read you just the back of the book here. And this is Max talking, and he says, um, "I was little more than a boy when my beloved France fell to the Nazi invaders, but when Winston Churchill recruited me as a special." secret agent shortly thereafter my youth did not matter all that mattered was my determination to rid europe of the nazi scourge the next four years of my life were spent behind enemy lines crisscrossing war-torn europe i went wherever duty called me working in the shadows of that great conflict i have saved lives and i have taken them that was my mission i was a spy this is my story and if you didn't just get goosebumps from that i did too <laughs> you're not you're not human okay once again welcome thank you for being with us welcome what a remarkable life. Before we talk about the book itself, um, what f brought you to finally write about your life in that respect? Uh, you know, so many of the World War II veterans that I still go out and talk to, and, and my dad fought in World War II, of course, and he was open and talked about his experiences. He flew against the Japanese up in the Aleutian in, uh, in World yeah. War II. But so many men are so reluctant to discuss this they were on battlefields, you were on a completely different type of battlefield. Yeah. What brought you, uh, with this lovely lady, to write this book? She's her? It's her fault. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Tell him. Oh, what happened? We got married in 1991, and mm -hmm. shortly after that, I don't know, in the 90s anyway, he would be having nightmares, and he'd wake up, and he'd be screaming, or he'd some one time I remember he was shouting, nine, nine, and I... I said, I told him, I said, when something bothers me, mm -hmm. I just write it down and it's cathartic and it helps me work through it and mm -hmm. then the, the bad memories don't have so much of a hold on me. Yeah. And I said, why don't you try it? And he did. That's great advice. And, and he did. And, um, you know, those big legal pads? He started writing and he started filling them up one after the other after the other and they started piling up and I don't remember when the idea came to put it into book form um, it was probably my idea I don't remember mm -hmm. but we decided to and then but his memories are in French mm -hmm. and so I had to translate them however I couldn't read his writing <laughs> he was studying to be a dentist. He should have been a doctor because <laughs> his writing is great for being a doctor. But um, so he put it on tape. Mm. Those things called cassette tapes that are almost yes, yeah. those ancient things. Right. Anyway, um, so he put them on tape, and then from that I translated them. Oh, wonderful! Yeah. And did, did it work for you, Max? Uh, it worked in a way, but the tape were left in the car, and they they melt. Oh, yeah. Oh, I have to start all over again. Oh, okay. Oh, I did. And but now, now you have this. Yeah. But and as far, I'm sorry, but as far as the nightmares, mm -hmm. they did lessen. Okay. They're not as often and they're not as strong, but every time we talk about I it, still have them. he still has them. So it's a post-traumatic stress syndrome, and it's yes, still it with you yeah. 70 years after the fact. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, these kinds of things I can understand um, really never heal. I think over the past year, or two years when uh, when viewers of the American television public had a chance to see Band of Brothers and then, ah. and then of course the Pacific 
they finally began to understand a little bit about what war really is. Yeah. Um, in a visual sense, people my age have, who've not been in the military and have not been in combat, we truly don't know. Mm -hmm. And that is in straight combat. What you did was behind the lines and the people you talked to and met and knew and let's pick it up at the very beginning okay. and have you start to tell us the first first 10 pages of this book you are meeting and talking with Winston Churchill. So how did that come about? Just take it and run with it. Okay. Uh, when I was a child, mm -hmm. uh, I was first, uh, until I was, let's put it that way, uh, two, in, uh, two years old, they put me in a, in a, in a uh, Orphan, like a nun. Mm -hmm. Then, after that, they they took a tutor, mm -hmm. uh, an Austrian colonel for a retired from the cavalry. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was seven, not being the time I should die by Churchill, uh, my godfather lived in Cap d'Artibe, in the south of France, mm -hmm. and he, my tutor took me over there to see him because my father didn't allow me to play with kids. Uh, he took me over there to find some kids and play with them. And in the, in the yard, there was uh, a man painting, and I didn't know who he was, but anyway, when we passed by, he called somebody inside and gave us cookies. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all what I knew at that time. And um, after that, uh, when I was seven years old, my tutor first, I should say, because he was, uh, I should say, an example mm -hmm. of a person. Take it. He was, um, he was a father figure for Max. Mm. His father was not well liked, nor respected, nor was he a nice man. He beat mm. up his mother, yeah. and mm. uh, Max was not allowed to have any con conversation with his mother. He wasn't allowed to talk to her from the time he was 18 months old. So um, this Austrian colonel, I wish I could have met him, was um, wonderful for Max. He was uh, regimented, he was disciplined, and he loved Max from what I can feel, mm -hmm. and uh, taught Max how to ride horses, taught him how to play tennis, taught him all the lessons, but also taught him how to fence, taught him how mm -hmm. to shoot a rifle, had mm -hmm. a rifle specially mm -hmm. made, had um, clothes made for him to learn how to ride horses, and really took care of him and really loved him. And um, in, in that way, it wasn't like a huggy-huggy kind of love, but Max needed the structure, right. and he needed somebody he could respect and look up to and he found him in this colonel. Stepped in and became the father you didn't have. Yes. Essentially. Yes, right. from the time he was three till seven. Okay. Yeah. And then and just before I was seven, I guess I don't remember exactly, but I did have enough of my father beating my mother. Oh, I, I took the gun on his desk and went and wait for him when he would be I did one of his mistress and I was hiding in the bush, and I was going to kill him. Mm. And uh, uh, one of his employees passed by and saw me in the bushes, and he took me back home. Mm. And that was the end of it. When I came back home next morning, I was shipped to the Jesuits. Again, it was the best thing I ever done. Mm. I enjoyed it so much. Yeah. They were so good. They were devoted. Mm -hmm. They were. They, the, their name they was the Paraclete Brothers. They were, uh, why do you say that, uh, uh, teaching? Many, they were being re-educated. Re mm. okay. I mean, right. the, the, the priest. Yeah. And uh, we were a separate, uh, uh, we didn't have nothing to do with them. But, Anyway, they give me a very good ed education. Mm -hmm. They will stay until midnight or whatever I want to learn, and I want to learn. Uh, 14, I right. uh, right. got my bachelor's degree. Well, let's fast forward yeah. to the beginning of this book. And you are outside of London, I believe. Um, yeah. And you have just met Winston Churchill mm -hmm. again. And 
he tells you that he has to go back to London for a few days, mm -hmm. and you are going off to train with the special forces, I guess, the British commandos. And of course, they at the time were absolutely the toughest in the world. They are. Yeah, and probably still are in many respects. <laughs> we'll have Green Beret in the audience from the United States and <laughs> Navy SEALs that'll disagree with us. Yeah. But um, what did Churchill have in mind for you? The, the uh, book makes the point that he had picked you for something. I don't know exactly what he had in mind for me, but he wanted me to be trained to drop from parachutes. And uh, that was his intention. And when he sent me to, uh, I was built like uh, my legs, well, I mean, my arm was as big as my legs. Mm -hmm. I was like this. Very the, muscular. The Jesuit really put me together. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, one mission after the other one, he never told me, you go and do this or you go and do that. He gave me the whatever it was. He gave him the goal. That the goal. What to and achieve. And that was it. And I went on my own and, and did it because I knew people. Josephine Baker, Maurice Chevalier, all those people were mm -hmm. familiar to me, and I knew I could do something. You see, his yeah. father owned cabarets in yeah. in Monaco. Oh, okay. And they were they, they were the the jet set the jet set came okay. to them, but there was no jets. But the, right, the, right. you'd you'd have you'd have the royalty, you'd have big political figures, and mm -hmm. they would go to these cabarets. And um, his, the Knickerbocker was yeah. the biggest one and the most important one. And there would be like the King of Sweden, Sweden was there. Uh, and uh, the King, uh, the one who was supposed to be the King of England, I forgot his name now. Oh, and he abdicated he to abdicated Mary. To oh, yes, yes, I yeah, remember yeah, who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People like that. Yeah. yeah. And people so, like that. He yeah, just, people like that. But just that's casually throws that off. That's the king the, of Eden, yeah, yeah. England. But that's the Sweden. milieu he was brought up in. Yes. I yes. mean, it's just it was just normal. So that when when he was given missions, mm -hmm. he had contacts from when he was a kid. Ah, uh, okay. We have already talked for twelve minutes. Oh my goodness. Oh. I know. Yeah, but so, can't get. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take <laughs> we're gonna take a little break, sure. and then we're gonna come back with our second segment. Okay. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank this you. Is fascinating. This is Face the State.